Before we start, just on your paper, I want you guys to write on a scale of 1 to 10, how serious are you about fighting sin? Like how bad do you want to fight sin on a scale of 1 to 10? Just somewhere on your paper, kind of give yourself a, a scale. Like how bad do you want to fight sin? Like how bad do you hate sin? You probably don't get asked that a lot, so take a minute to think about it. And then just write down why you ranked yourself what you did. I don't know, you guys, you guys are calling small groups, so I'm sure you don't want like, the person to see, see what you wrote next to you, but go and write it, and then write down why you gave yourself that number. And one more question I want you guys to write. What would be your main motivation for fighting sin, avoiding sin, fighting? What would be your main motivation? If you had to write down motive, what would be your main motivation? Okay, let's start by opening up to 2 Corinthians 7.10. 2 Corinthians 7.10. We'll start in that passage. Second Corinthians 7.10. All right, Nick, you want to read that if you got it? Read it out loud. 7.10. Yeah. Oh, there's two Nicks. Yeah, go ahead. Nick in the blue shirt. You got right. it. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Okay, so that's, so godly grief, that would be like repentance or sorrow for sin. The word grief, repentance, sorrow for sin. So godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So as a Christian, there are ways we could handle sin that can lead to death spiritual death there is a way we can handle sin that leads to death and there's a way that we handle sin that can lead to salvation and life and the motive for why we fight sin or turn from sin is the deciding factor and so here godly grief so the question is what is godly grief what is worldly grief worldly grief let me give you an example a lot of times you know, i work with young men and Pornography is a struggle with men. If you say, why do you want to stop, you know, pornography? And a lot of times a guy will say, well, it's going to ruin my future marriage or it will wreck my, my life, my whatever. It makes me feel like dirty. It wrecks my relationship. That's called worldly grief, and that leads to death. So anything is with worldly consequences leads to death. And so when we think of sin, like, oh, I want to be a wholesome, good father for my kids. Therefore, I don't want to do this. That's worldly, and that will lead to death. But if we say, hey, what's our motive for it? It's like, I just want to please God. I don't want to break his heart. His Christ's blood was shed on my behalf. I don't want to like spit on his blood and on the cross and spurn that, spurn like spitting on that. I don't want to do that. I want to please the Father. Now that would be godly grief, godly motivation. So when we think about sin, our motive for fighting it is everything. I want to give you one more passage before we kind of really dive in to just help you see how big of a deal sin is. Go to Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Mark 9, 42. Before we read that, um, 
just get like, for some reason, uh, when did you guys ever think about like, what are the worst ways I could die? You guys ever kind of run that in your mind ever? I know it's like not a great thing to think about, but it's like, oh, if I ever had to die, like this would be the worst. For some reason, one of the worst ones, I think it was in a movie that I saw and it happened. I think it was actually the movie uh, uh, Midway. You guys ever see that World War II movie at all? It's a, but one of the guys gets captured by the Japanese. And what they do is they tie uh, an anchor, like a, uh, like a ball and chain around his hands, is it? His hands, they throw them in the ocean. And you kind of have this image of like, that's probably gotta be one, like the thought of sinking deeper. Like, I don't know if it's the pressure or drowning, but you can't, like you can maybe fight it, but eventually a, a 20, 30 pound weight will sink you down. It's like, that's a bad way to go out and probably worse than even your hands tied around some kind of weight and being tossed into the heart of the sea would be the thought of maybe a weight tied around your neck and going head first. And Jesus is going to use this. So go to, to Mark 9, 42. He's going to use this imagery, this exact, like, one of, I think, one of the worst ways to die to explain the severity of sin. So Mark 9, 42, Jesus says this. Um, it says, whoever causes one of these little ones to go, that whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. But that's like weighty language. Like that's vivid imagery. And Jesus is saying that it's better that you die than that you cause sin to other people. With these little ones, it's better that, you, that's a strong language. Like, Jesus' attitude towards sin is very serious. Like, it is better to die than to struggle with certain sins. Jesus says, it's better that you, your life be ended. Sin is so serious. And Christ died to forgive us. But if we are going to believe and pursue and love Christ, we have to have a hatred and seriousness towards our sin. Okay, so we'll go. I think your outline now begins. That was, I don't think that was part of pull one of these outlines out. Okay, so the first thing is, can I really be free of sin? I think that's a common question people deal with. Like, can I be free of sin? Especially if you have a reoccurring sin to struggle with. You might wonder, can I really be free of this? So there's kind of three, let's, we'll talk about three things right, relates to sin. So the first blank is justification. That's from Romans 8, 1 and 2. Justification, that's freedom from sin's penalty. When Christ dies on the cross, we are free from sin's penalty. And that happens now. The second blank is sanctification. Sanctification. That's freedom from sin's, freedom from sin's power. That's Romans 8, 1 through 11. Sanctification. Freedom from sin's power. And that can happen now. Like We are free from that enslaving power of sin. Now, the third one is glorification. That's from Philippians 1.6, glorification. And that's freedom from sin's presence. Freedom from sin's presence. And you could circle that one, and I think biblically that doesn't happen now. Glorification is to come. And so we will never be free from the presence of sin. However, we are free from sin's penalty and sin's power. So the first two, it's like we have those enacted with us now through the cross, glorification, that's fully to come. We get a little of that in part, but that's fully to come. So the goal this time, as your, your next blank, is to fight sin well. The goal this time that we learn to fight sin well. We fight sin well. Um, so the next section is fighting sin according to Jesus. I think Jesus is going to give us the best grid, grid work to understand and to fight sin. So first passage, go to Matthew 15, 19 through 20. Matthew 15, 19 through 20. <coughs> Uh, Nick, boy, are you going to read that out loud for us? From out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Okay, let's read that, Nick. 
So the blank there is getting to the heart. Getting to the heart. So there's something about that passage that gets to the heart. And so Jesus is saying, out of the heart come these evil things. So out of the heart, the heart. And that's very important to understand about sin, is that sin's roots run deep into our heart. They're just not like, I need to stop looking at. I need to stop. There's things in our heart that we're wanting. And so getting to the heart is, is one part that Jesus is going to talk about. Now the next part, go to Matthew 5, 27 through 30. I know I think your your passage is 528. We actually need to do 527 through 30. Matthew 5, 27 through 30. We have Kale, you're gonna read that out loud for us. Yep. You have heard that it, it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her heart in it, with her in his heart. Keep going. Go to go up till 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Okay, so write that blank practical. There's something extremely practical about Jesus' approach to sin in that passage. So if you're right hand, cut it off. Right eye, gouge it out. Like it's real simple. Just get rid of it. So there's something that we see in Jesus that has something to do with the heart and something that's practical. And so you guys have two circles. Um, on the left circle, kind of write the heart. So on the left, write the heart. And on the right, write practical. These are from those two passages. So left, the heart, right, practical. And in the middle is fighting sin. That if you want to fight sin well, you live in that middle part of dealing with the heart and the practical side of your sin. So the heart and practical in the middle is fighting sin. Left side, the heart, right side, practical, in the middle, fighting sin. And so we are going to, the rest of our time, I mean, we're, we don't have to, we're not going to spend tons and tons of time. The next five minutes of our time, we're going to just... Um, understand this uh, diagram. My mind works in diagrams some way, so I hope this helps you, but we're going to understand the diagram and what it means to live in the middle, okay? So, for example, let's say somebody approached their sin just with the heart, without the practical, okay? Just with the heart. And like I said, I disciple young men a lot, and a lot of times they will um, get a girlfriend, and sometimes they cross the line with that, and there's a lot of times a guy will, you know, when I say, hey, what happened? You know, that a couple nights ago, and they're like, well, we crossed the line, blah, blah, and, you know, they'll say some things, I'll say, well, tell me, explain some more, like, what happened, what's going on, and they'll say things like, oh, we just weren't treasuring Jesus, or trusting Jesus, and it's kind of moments like, that's cool, but, like, how about you don't spend time alone at night together, like, how about that, and there's a, a practical edge that's missing to the repentance, so sometimes we get, we, it's called like over-spiritualizing our sin, I just need to love and treasure Jesus and spend more time in his word. And it's like, yeah, those things are true. But like, how about you just don't do that? Like, how about like you, you don't, you know, you, you, you get rid of your social media on your phone. How about like, there's, there's gotta be a practical side to how we deal with sin. And then if, if we live too much in the practical side, it could look like, Hey, I just, Hey, I keep, you know, looking at things I shouldn't on my phone. I'm going to get rid of social media. And there's no, okay, what does your heart want? What's going on inside your heart with regards to sin? You don't find, you don't get to the root of what is going on, what Jesus is going to say in that Matthew, was it Matthew 15 passage? And so we want to live in the middle of doing ruthlessly practical things, very practical things, as well as understanding what our heart's wanting and trying to get with our sin. And we need both those things to happen um, at once. I'll give an example. Uh, so... When the quarantine first hit, uh, what was that, March? So for the first time in like 11, 12 years of my life, my evenings are free. So in college ministry, your evenings are often with students. It's like they're, they're their most free time. So like my evenings are free. And I found it pretty nice to have a beer or a glass of wine at night. And I could do it every night because at this point, like my evenings are free. I'm not going back to campus or in a Bible study. And like, I never got drunk or anything, but I remember... Like, I remember like after like a couple weeks, like I drank every night and I felt like there's like this problem. Like I felt like I look forward to this. I'm enjoying this too much. Like 
It's happening every night. And I begin to like, so I spent some time journaling about it. And I realized like, I think in my heart, there's like this, this thought that I've worked really hard for you, God, the last 11 years, I deserve a break. And this is my break and every night's mine and I can do what I want. And that was sinful in and of itself. But to do that, but then also be like, yeah, good. I repent of that, but I'm still going to drink every night. There's something that's sort of wrong about that. That's not true repentance. And so I did that and I thought, I'm just going to go a month, like no alcohol in the house, like get rid of it. Because I think for my heart to get to the place where it treasured Jesus more than a night with alcohol, it's like I needed to have no alcohol in the house. And just that's what repentance looks like. It's not just understanding my heart, but it's also asking the question, what do I need to do in order this, for this never to happen again? So that's kind of a little bit of, of, of mine. So flip your page. Keep going. Flip your page. And these are three questions that I think will help us um, help us take a biblical approach to how to how to fight or deal with sin. So the first question says this: What am I wanting that I'm not getting? So with alcohol, it's like the thing that I wanted was just a break and a relaxing, that kind of like this deserving mentality. I just wanted like a nice, refreshing evening. That's what I, that's what I want. Okay, so you're wanting something that's tracing the sin to the roots of your heart. And then the second question is, how does the cross address this? Because Christ died for our sins. Like we're not moralists. We don't just try better, work harder. Like how does the cross address this? Like so, the cross address my sin with alcohol in that. I'm forgiven through the cross. His righteousness is in alcohol. Like with regards to alcohol, is mine. Like he was perfect. That righteousness is given to me. And then through the cross, I could be empowered to live a holy life. So then the third question is, what needs to happen for this never to happen again? So for me, no alcohol in the house. It'll never happen again. So just take an area in your life and work through that grid just right now. I'll give you guys five minutes. Like what is something in your life? So what am I getting I'm not wanting? How does the cross address this? What needs to happen for this never to happen again? Just think through something and journal through it. I was going to make you guys share this at your table, but I won't. So feel free to make it as personal as you want. You guys, for your own good. <laughs> 